the Department of Justice have a position <coughs> on whether the Constitution allows the U.S. government to use a drone to kill a U.S. citizen in those circumstances. Yet again, he said, it wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> Three times we went back and forth. I, I, I really thought any minute he was going to say to me, I, I do not understand that this Constitution to which you're referring. <laughs> But during the 13-hour filibuster that day, as one senator after another after another came to the floor of the Senate, as 20 House members came to the floor of the Senate, again, just as with guns, thousands upon thousands of men and women all across this country got involved, spoke up, got online, got on Twitter, stood for liberty. And as a result, the next day, the Obama administration was forced to do what it had refused to do for three straight weeks, which is admit in writing, no, the Constitution doesn't let it kill a U.S. citizen on the United We should be defending the Tenth Amendment. And one of the most critical elements of doing that is we should repeal every single word of Obamacare. opportunity to salute your governor, Nikki Haley, for having the courage to say no. <laughs> South Carolina has a tradition, long, long tradition of producing <laughs> fighters, and Nikki Haley is a rock star who is inspiring the country. Thank you, Governor. <laughs> you know, with Obamacare, as it gets implemented, it's getting less and less popular because more and more people are realizing it simply isn't working. A couple of weeks ago, the senior Democrat who was the principal architect of Obamacare said Obamacare was becoming a, quote, train wreck. Well, I agree with that Democratic senator. You know, I'm reminded of one of my heroes, a former senator from the state of Texas, Bill Grant. Senator Graham was participating in a hearing on socialized medicine. And the panel was explaining, was talking about socialized medicine, and Senator Graham said, well, you know, I feel confident that I care about my kids more than anybody else does. And one of the witnesses on the panel said, with all due respect, Senator, I care about your kids just as much as you do. <laughs> Senator Graham looked at him and said, really? What are their names? <laughs> <laughs> there is almost no limit to what this president, this administration thinks the federal government can do. We've got to get back to the U.S. Constitution. We've got to get back to limits on federal government power. We've got to get back to our Yes. That's how we turn it. Third principle of the American spirit is growth. I think the very top priority of every elected official is restoring economic growth. You know, in the last four years, our economy has grown 0.9%. 0.9%. There's only one other period since World War II of four consecutive years of less than 1% growth. That was 1979 and 1982. Coming, coming out of the Jimmy Carter administration, same failed economic policies, out of control spending, out of control debt, out of control taxes, out of control regulation. And it led to the exact same stagnation. Look, growth is fundamental to solving every other problem. If we want to get the 23 million people who are struggling to find jobs back to work, we need growth. If we want to turn around our unsustainable deficits and debt, we've got to have growth. If we want to ensure that we maintain the strongest military in the world to defend our national security, we must have growth. And I think growth should be a bipartisan thing. There is no reason why Republicans and Democrats can't be working side by side to get our economy going again, to build the Keystone Pipeline, to stop regulations, to put the tax reform, to get small businesses moving. You know, a couple of days ago, 
Jay Leno observed. So, the president is having a hard time shutting down Guantanamo. Well, I've got an idea. He could just declare it's a small business, do what he always does, and tax it out of existence. <laughs> He'd be gone in days, weeks, talk. We need growth. And the fourth and final thing that we need is opportunity. Growth is fundamental for so many reasons, but the most important is that growth produces opportunity. For a long time, I've been arguing for what I call opportunity conservatism, which is that every principle, every policy you think about and talk about should focus like a laser on opportunity, on easing the needs of the set up the economic life. The greatest engine of prosperity and opportunity and wealth creation the world has ever seen is the free market system in the United States. Yes. And let me tell you something, there is no member of the U.S. Senate who understands that better than Senator James Scott. I love Senator James Scott. And let me tell you one of the reasons, because he understands in his gut that if you're struggling to climb the economic ladder, the only thing that has ever worked is a free market system that allows small businesses to prosper, allows people to stand on their own feet, that doesn't create dependency, but encourages people to work and stand on their own feet and strive towards the American dream. You know, I love listening to Senator Scott talk about how he was in high school. And as he described, he said he was close to fucking out of high school. He had failed, as he put it, both English and Spanish. And Senator Scott observed, when you fail English and Spanish, they don't say you're bilingual. <laughs> they say you're bilingual. <laughs> and he tells a powerful story of meeting a man who he described as a mentor, who owned a couple of Chick-fil-A franchises. And he brought him under his wing, and he said, Tim, the path you're on is not going to take you to where you want to be. That's not how you get to the American dream. If you want to get to prosperity, you have to rely on hard work. You have to rely on discipline. You have to apply yourself in school. You have to go and create a small business. You have to go and create jobs. You have to take advantage of the incredible opportunity in this country. That is Tim Scott's life. That is the opportunity we as Republicans should champion. You know, the unemployment we see in this economy doesn't fall uniformly over the population. It falls most severely on the most vulnerable of us. If you got a college here, unemployment right now is 3.8%. Pretty robust labor market for high school college graduates. If you don't have a high school degree, unemployment is over 12%. Hispanics is nearly 10%. African Americans, 14%. Young people, age 16 to 19, it's over 25%. You know, one third of young people age 25 to 29 are moving back in with their parents. One third. <laughs> The Obama economy, the people who are being hit the worst are young people, are single moms, are African Americans, are Hispanics, are those struggling to climb the economic ladder. And as Republicans, we need to be challenging every day. The way you achieve prosperity is you have economic growth that allows, there has been no nation on earth, that has allowed so many millions of people to come with nothing and achieve it. You know, I have to say, when I talk about opportunity, in my life, as in all of your lives, it's not some abstract concept you read about in the book. It's a reality we've all lived. My dad is from Cuba. He was born in Cuba, he grew up in Cuba as a kid, and my father fought the Cuban Revolution. When he was a teenager, he was thrown in prison and tortured. He was 
beaten almost to death. He fled Cuba in 1957. He was 18 years old. He came to Texas. When he arrived, he couldn't speak English. He had nothing except for $100 sewn into his underwear. And a slide wheel in his pocket. You know, Chad, when I talk to young people, they have no idea what a slide wheel <laughs> And he got a job washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour. And he worked seven days a week. He paid his way through the University of Texas. And he went on to start a small business, working towards the American dream. When I was a kid, my father used to say to me over and over again, when we lost our freedom in Cuba, I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? You know, that fundamentally is why every one of us is here. My dad's been my hero my whole life, but what I find most incredible about his story is how commonplace it is. Every one of us could come up here one after the other and tell stories like that. We are all the children of those who risk everything for freedom. I think that's the most fundamental DNA of what it means to be an American. And that's why we're here tonight fighting to take our country. I want to make two final points of conclusion. The first is change happens quickly. A lot of Republicans are demoralized about November 2012. I want to remind you of 2005. In 2005, George W. Bush had just been re-elected president. Republicans had control of both the House and the Senate and a large majority of the governorships. And Democrats we're going on television, Democrat consultants, publicly talking about a, quote, permanent Republican majority. That was 2005. 2006, we lost Congress. 2008, Barack Obama got elected. 2009, Obamacare passes. And here we are today. Things can change quickly. And because of the legacy of Jim DeMint, because of the leaders in the Senate and in the House who are fighting, I believe change will come quickly. In particular, I am convinced with your help, we're going to take back the U.S. Senate 2014. How many of you have cell phones on? I'm going to ask you to take your cell phones off. Out. And text the word growth to 33733. Growth to 33733. And help join us to take the Senate back in 2014. Stand together because we're going to take the Senate back in 2014. And we're going to stand in the Senate and fight together to defend our nation. The last thing I want to say is an observation. Ronald Reagan famously said, freedom is not passed down in the bloodstream. Instead, every generation has to stand and fight for it to preserve it. And that's what we're called on to do tonight. So I want to share with you the words that were written by a native Carolinian, South Carolinian, William Barrett Travis. His last letter from the island which read as follows. Fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more. I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison would be put to the sword. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot. And our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and of everything dear to the American character, to come to our aid with all dispatch. If this call is neglected, 
I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death. William Perry Travis, a native South Carolinian, a Texas hero, and like each and every man and woman here, someone who stood up and put it all on the line, fighting for liberty, fighting for this country we love so very much. Thank you, and God bless you.